This is a photograph of a cypress tree that was growing in the Hatchet Creek floodplain near Austin Carey Forest. I just thought it was beautiful. It has a straight trunk. It's huge, very tall, probably not a branch for 75 feet. Just a gorgeous tree. You might think about, when I think about breeding, I think about, wow, how might I, for instance, regenerate a tree that looks like that in a repeatable way? And that's really the central question of tree improvement or tree breeding, is how do we know what traits are under genetic control and how do we harness the genetic variation in those traits to improve a population for the traits that we're interested in. The basis of all of this is the concept of the phenotype. So the phenotype is the left term in this equation. This is just any observable trait. You know, in the picture I just showed, phenotype could be size at a particular age. It could be the absence of disease. It could be the straightness of the stem. It could be anything that we can observe or measure. That's the phenotype. And that phenotype results from two factors. The genotype, that's the G, and the environment. So obviously the, the genotype is the genome of an individual, all of the genes it has. And then the environment is, is the environment it's growing in. Both of those things influence the phenotype. And then in addition, there's an interaction term, the interaction of genetic genetics or genotype by environment. That interaction just means that uh, in some cases, the expression of a particular gene or set of genes in the phenotype depends on the environment that the plant is in, in that particular location. So that's essentially a combination of control between genes and environment. So the central challenge of tree breeding or tree improvement is understanding to what degree that genotype term controls the observed phenotype for the traits that we're interested in. If most or all of the control of a particular phenotypic trait is in the environment, then we can't select in the population for that trait. That trait is expressed primarily based on the environment that the plant is grown in. So there's really no use in breeding for that. But if there's some trait that's under some degree of genetic control, then we can select individuals that are more likely uh, to, to produce a particular phenotype or desirable trait. Now there are two main types of traits um, that we deal with in org or organisms. One uh, type is Mendelian traits. It's obviously named after Gregor Mendel, the um, clergyman that uh, did experiments with peas uh, and gave us some of our first understanding of genetic inheritance. So Mendelian traits um, are traits uh, that are controlled by one or a s very small number of genes. So Mendelian traits are, are controlled by maybe one gene or maybe just a few genes. And the 
role of the environment is for Mendelian traits, the environment plays little to no role in the expression of a trait. Okay, so if there's a particular trait that's under Mendelian control, uh, so for instance, uh, the ability to roll your tongue like that, that's under Mendelian, uh, that's a Mendelian trait. So if you have the tongue rolling gene, it doesn't matter what your diet is or what your mom's diet was or what environment you live in, you either have that trait or you don't. It's not under environmental control, it's under strict um, genetic control. So some examples uh, of Mendelian traits. So all of the Mendel P traits, like wrinkled peas and some of the colors, uh, those obviously were Mendelian traits. Eye color in humans, whether you have a widow's peak, whether your hair sort of forms an Eddie Munster widow's peak, that's a Mendelian trait. Um, there's some disease trait, diseases like uh, sickle cell anemia or hemophilia that are uh, Mendelian. In trees, there, there are a few traits not very many traits that have been identified as Mendelian, probably primarily disease resistance traits that have shown up as Mendelian in trees. The inheritance of Mendelian traits, uh, one way we can look at those is using a Punnett square. You probably remember Punnett squares from your um, you know, high school biology class. So let's imagine a particular gene that has a dominant and recessive parts. So let's say um, we have two parents. So this is parent one here. This is parent one. This is parent two. And they're both um, heterozygous for that particular trait. So when, when those uh, parents mate, there are these possible combinations of those genes during recombination. So there's the heterozygous dominant, I'm sorry, the homozygous dominant, the heterozygous, which are these two, or the homozygous um, the homozygous recessive. And looking at those, at the um, distribution of those genotypes, we can graph the frequency distribution. Let's say these parents mated 100 times. We could graph the frequency distribution of the different gene types. So you can see that um, half of the offspring will have the heterozygous um, gene type, a quarter will have the homozygous dominant and a quarter will have the homozygous recessive. Um, so genes are inherited in the population in a discrete way. So the distribution of the frequency of genes in the offspring for Mendelian traits is in a fixed, uh, discrete ratio uh, that's fairly predictable, like this. So in progeny, um, Mendelian traits are distributed um, in a discrete way. A little tangent, um, thinking about the inheritance of for instance, really serious uh, Mendelian diseases like um, sickle cell anemia or hemophilia, those diseases are 
often expressed when or, or often carried in the recessive form of the gene and are only expressed in a homozygous recessive situation. Um, so in order to get the disease, uh, both of your parents have to at least be a carrier uh, for of that recessive gene. They may, so in this case, if the little a, little a is, for instance, the expression of hemophilia, both of your parents won't have hemophilia, but they're carrying that gene and a fourth of their offspring will have hemophilia. Most of these recessive genes are quite rare because they've been bred out of, selected out of the population because these serious genetic diseases um, tend to kill people. Um, so these genes are rare. Um, but the, the um, expression or the occurrence of these diseases is more likely when related parents breed together. So th this in reality is likely the basis of the um, human of the human taboo against incest is because um, offspring from incestuous matings or closely related matings are more likely to produce children with some of these uh, terrible genetic traits uh, because the mating of related parents, if there's a uh, recessive gene in that family, for instance, offspring of related matings are more likely to produce offspring with that disease. And that's why, for instance, hemophilia was more common in royal families in Europe back in the day because those families tended to intermate for political purposes. And that tended to maintain some of these uh, dangerous recessive genes in the populations. Now, polygenic traits are in contrast to Mendelian traits in all those same um, characteristics. You know, polygenic, you know, in its own name means those traits are controlled by many genes. And Generally, for polygenic traits, uh, the environment plays a significant role in the expression of that polygenic trait. Now, the distribution of uh, traits in a population for polygenic traits is continuous. So with Mendelian, it was discrete. We had half of one um, phenotype, a quarter of another phenotype, and a quarter of another phenotype. But for polygenic traits, the distribution of offspring, the frequency distribution is continuous and often you know, has centrality. May not be normal, but uh, it has centrality like this frequency distribution. So uh, the reality is that most traits of interest for trees are, are polygenic. So things like height, diameter, uh, resistance to a number of diseases are all polygenic. Um, and because those traits uh, are significantly affected by the environment, what that means is that we can't just go out into the woods uh, and observe a tree and say that is a genetically superior tree. Because that tree may have a desirable phenotype because it's in a good environment. It's what I call the dead dog effect. A seedling may have germinated on top of a dead dog and it's growing rapidly because there are abundant nutrients 
in that location. Um, and because growth is a polygenic trait, um, the environment plays a strong role in the expression of that trait. So um, the design of tree breeding programs, because they are primarily dealing with polygenic traits, center around the need to separate the effects of environment from the effects of genotype and to quantify the role of genotype in the expression of any particular trait so that we can identify the genetic value of a particular individual as, in most cases, a parent um, of potentially superior offspring. So that's really the basis of breeding programs. So probably the most important tool in modern tree breeding is quantitative genetics. And quantitative genetics is just a set of statistical tools which in combination with carefully designed breeding and testing experiments enable the separation of genetic and environmental effects. And G by E. So people spend their entire careers um, using and developing quantitative genetics tools. Um, so you can take, you know, an entire major in quantitative genetics. So I'm just going to mention a couple of um, key metrics, quantitative genetics metrics that you might run into, for instance, uh, in if you're talking with a tree breeder, for instance. So one of the most important um, measures is heritability. So qualitatively, heritability is just the degree of ge genetic control over a particular trait. Quantitatively, it's the variation due to genetics divided by the total variation. So the variation due to genetics, environment, and G by E. Okay, so that quantitatively tells you, okay, what fraction of the total variation is caused by or under control of the genes? That's heritability. So because it's a proportion of a whole, heritability ranges from zero to one. If a trait has a heritability of one, then it's under complete genetic control and environment has no effect on the expression of that trait. Opposite is true with the heritability of zero. Heritability of zero, there's no genetic control and the environment completely controls variation in that trait. Generally in breeding programs, heritability for traits like growth or disease resistance uh, probably generally ranges between maybe 0 0.2 and 0 0.4. So between 20 and 40 percent of the variation that, that's observed in genetics tests is, is controlled by genetics. So again, a significant fraction of the variation that's observed is still due to the environment. But when the heritability is at that 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 range, that's sig significant enough control for there to be meaningful selection for a particular trait. So generally, we only breed for traits that have you know, significant heritability.
Another important quantitative genetics um, measurement are genetic correlations. At one level, genetic correlations um, express the degree to which genetic control of one trait is related to uh, the genetic control of a different trait. That phenomenon um, is pleiotropy. So pleiotropy, this occurs when uh, there is overlap in the genes controlling two traits. So remember, these are, are polygenic traits, so they're controlled by many genes. And let's say, you know, trait A, maybe it's height, um, is controlled by 50 genes, and trait B, DBH, is controlled by 75 genes. And let's say those two traits have 30 genes in common. So they're not entirely controlled by the same genes, but there are some genes that are involved in the control of both. That overlap is termed pleiotropy. And when, when pleiotropy exists, that means there's genetic correlation between those two traits. And we can express them in a scatter plot like this, where this might be um, the genetic value for height, and that means basically the genetic control with the environmental, environmental part taken out versus the genetic value for DBH, which is just the genetic control with environment taken out. And you can see those are correlated with each other. And in this case, they're positively correlated. So positively correlated genetic traits say that um, trees that tend to have a genetic tendency to have a large DBH also have a genetic tendency to have a large height. So in this case, there's pleiotropy between DBH and height. So there's overlap in the genes controlling DBH and height. Um, so think about this situation where we're looking at the genetic correlation between disease incidence at age five years and mass at age five years. So suppose you're selecting for growth rate, uh, which might be mass at age five years, uh, and there is this genetic correlation in the population. Is this a problem? So if we're just selecting individuals that have large mass at age five years, let's say we're selecting uh, individuals in the population that are large at age five years. Is this genetic correlation a problem? Yes, of course it is. Because when we selected individuals that have large mass, we are indirectly selecting individuals that have a genetic tendency towards high disease incidence at age five. That is called indirect selection. When we select on one trait, um, if that trait is genetically correlated with a second trait or has pleiotropy with a second trait, we are also selecting for that other trait maybe sometimes unknowingly. And that, that is indirect trait. When select, selection for or against one trait causes a change in a second trait because it's genetically correlated. That is indirect selection. Um, now that can occur the other way when there's a negative um, genetic correlation. Let's say we select in the population for trees that tend to be large at age five years. Um, if there's a negative genetic correlation with disease incidence, um, then that's a positive uh, case. When we select for large trees at age five, we are indirectly selecting 
for low disease incidence. So that genetic correlation, because it's negative in this case, is desirable. Or we might have a situation where um, there is no genetic correlation. So mass at age five years is not genetically correlated or has no pleiotropy with disease incidence of a particular disease at age five years. Um, in that case, this is not a problem because there's no genetic correlation. So there will not be indirect selection where we select for uh, trees with high mass at age five there's really no particular tendency for disease uh, incidents in this case because they're not genetically correlated. So that genetic correlation can tell us something about uh, indirect selection and whether in indirect selection for some other trait might occur when we select for a particular trait in a population. Another um, genetic type of genetic correlation that is important in tree breeding is age-age genetic correlations. Age-age genetic correlations are just when we look at a particular trait, in this case height, at two different ages in the same population. So say we look at height at age two, its genetic component, and, com and look at height again at age 20 years and uh, see whether those two things are correlated. So in this case, you can see that uh, the genetic tendency towards height at age two years is not well correlated with height at age 20. So for instance, um, you know, trees, individuals in the population that tend to be tall at age two years might be relatively short um, at age 20 years or might be relatively tall at age 20 years. There's really no correlation between those two. In contrast, for instance, looking at height at age five years versus age 20 years, in this example, trees that tend to be tall at age five years also tend to be tall at age 20 years. In this case, that age-age correlation between height at age 5 and height at age 20 are strong. There's a strong age-age genetic correlation. So how might that correlation be important for a tree breeding program? So let's look specifically at those examples we, we looked at. The, age, age, at age two, there's really no correlation. But at age five, there was a strong correlation. How might that be important? In this case, for instance, height at age 20 is an important commercial trait. We are interested in trees that at the end of a rotation, say 20 years, <coughs> are tall. But when we're testing these populations or selecting these populations, we would prefer not to wait 20 years to determine which trees genetically are going to grow tall. And if we know that there's a strong age-age correlation between age five, height at age five and height at age 20, so it's hidden behind uh, my picture, but this is age five, If we know that this strong correlation exists at age five, that tells us that we could go in at age five and select the winners and know that we have a high probability uh, when we go in at age five of selecting individuals that will also be tall at age 20. So this has been done, for instance, in breeding programs for commercially important trees. And in Southern Pines, we know that there's a strong age-age correlation for growth traits at between age three and age five. So uh, tree breeders know that if they select for growth traits at between age three and five, they know there's a strong age-age correlation starting at about age three to five, so they can select the winners 
at three to five years. So that's another way that genetic correlations are really important in tree breeding programs in determining when those selections can be made.